Have you all just come from the film? Wasn't it wonderful? Yes. I'd like to invite Peter Middleton to the stage and please express your how wonderful the film was. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Sandy. So we've got an hour all up. We're going to talk for about 45 minutes and then open questions to you guys. Um, my aim is to cover all the questions you've got in your mind till we get to, before we get to that. No, not really. Um, Peter, let's start with this one. I read somewhere that you looked through a lot of memoir and biographical material in order to find yourself a story. Is that correct or is that just marketing rubbish? Um, and if it is correct, did you find a kind of treasure trove of things? Yeah, it's, um, thank you, Sonny. It's, uh, it's it's not entirely incorrect, no, but we were, about five and a half years ago, myself and my co-director, James Spinney, were um, researching various kind of first-person testimonies on blindness for, with kind of view to making a, an altogether different project that was mostly focusing on the relationship between senses and, uh, and, and, and uh, adverse weather, actually, and snowfall. Um, and then we came across John's book, which was uh, a book called Touching the Rock, which was published in, in the early 1990s. And it's very much kind of regarded as one of the um, a very important book in terms of subjective experience of, of, of blindness. And, and people like Oliver Sacks um, have written quite extensively about the book uh, subsequently. Now, in the foreword to it, it mentioned that there was um, that the, the book, which kind of reads like a diary, was based on these audio cassettes that John had kept between 1983 and 1986. And, um, and so James and myself quickly recognized that if these, if these cassettes were still in existence, then that would make some pretty compelling material um, on which to base a, a, a film. And that kind of started the journey from there, really. But it was audio without pictures. I mean, in those very early days when you thought, wow, well, let's use this, did you have a clear idea about the vision that would go with it, or was that something that was very much developed over time? Um, yeah, it was, it was something that, that, that took a bit of time to develop, really. We were, I mean, I'm not sure, if, has anyone read John's book, Touching the Rock? There may be some people who have. Um, John's sister here is here, so I'm sure she has. Um, it's, it's an incredible account. Um, it, it's... Uh, it paints a very vivid, um, it's a very vivid testimony on the experience, first-hand experience of, of sight loss, obviously, but also says uh, it's very far-reaching in terms of, um, terms of the, uh, what it covers, in terms of um, documenting his relationship with his family, um, overcoming some of the sort of practical challenges of, of, of sight loss, how to, how to cross roads, how to communicate with strangers. Um, but it also details this kind of neurological rewiring that, that John experienced after losing sight. And it's quite fascinating and quite profound. And John was such an intelligent and articulate um, uh, person that he really has a sort of a depth and, and precision um, of articulating this that, that we found incredibly compelling. Um, and so, equally, like, the account is very kind of, very internal, um, and we wanted to find a way of kind of accessing that interiority, and, and I think that we were, right from the beginning, we were a little, we weren't convinced that sort of the, many of the conventional tools of documentary, things like observational uh, recording or talking heads interview, would actually bring us close to the subject and, and be able to access that kind of immediacy that's contained within these audio recordings. So we began kind of experimenting with some of our collaborators, uh, namely our, our, our cinematographer, a very talented chap called Joe Floyd, about different ways of kind of approaching this material um, and embedding it within a sort of, um, sort of you know, reenactments as is, 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 uh, some people have described it, but just finding creative approaches really to interpreting this material. And can you explain um, the, the direct sources besides the actual audio tapes themselves? I believe there were 16 hours of audio tapes originally, but the other dialogue that's heard in the film, where, where else did that come from? Yeah, thank you for the question. It's, um, it's quite a kind of complicated patchwork of different 
sources, actually. So we made, initially, when we first, uh, when John um, first kind of entrusted us with this, the, these cassettes, as you say, 16 hours worth, the, 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 we made a series of short films. We made the first one, which played here, as I, as I said at the beginning of the, the, the screening, and played here in 2013. And that was just a three-minute film. It's it effectively the kind of the rainfall scene that, that's in the film. Um, and, and, that, and that, that then led on to a sort of a 12-minute film, which was uh, commissioned by the New York Times. And it allowed us to kind of get momentum together to get, get the funding in place for the feature film. But those two short films were just based on the audio from John's original diaries. Um, but along the way, new material kind of came to light. And um, I was just telling Sandy upstairs about one occasion, scarily close to the beginning of production, about six months before we were due to shoot, where we'd, we'd gone up to visit John and Marilyn and, um, and asked them to... We were particularly interested in, in the period of time when they go to Australia, that, that sort of family holiday, that sort of turning point when John returns to Australia. And we'd asked them to kind of source, uh, so to pull, pull out any correspondence he'd had with his parents. And we turned up and the... the um, the, the kitchen table was kind of strewn with these blue airmail envelopes, and we just thought, well, this is fantastic. There's going to be plenty in here to get our teeth into. Um, but we were quickly deflated, as John told us, that they stopped uh, from about 1981, when he lost his sight and couldn't write anymore, and, and began again in 1987, when he had someone to dictate. But nonetheless, we had these boxes of audio cassettes from the time, um, which were effectively kind of spoken letters that were passed back and forth um, between his family in Australia and home. So that along, and, and actually in, in that, that sort of trove of cassettes was also a lot of the kind of actuality recordings that you hear in the film. Um, things like Christmas Day, where, where John would set up recorders around the house on special occasions, really. Um, and so we had, the, we had this, yeah, the voices of the family suddenly were able to sort of feed in there. And that really brought a, a depth and of, of, of kind of, um, yeah, a sort of intimacy and, and humanity, really. And, and alongside that, the recordings of his daughter Imogen, who has those kind of radio shows, those weather reports that punctuate, that was all in the same box. So it's... These, these materials were kind of surfacing all along, and, and as, they, as they would, we kind of worked them in. Um, but the other one, which of course is, is, is worth mentioning, is sort of the contemporary tier of narration, if you like. So um, these were, as you say, kind of interviews with John and Marilyn. Um, and I use the word interviews sort of carefully, because really what James and myself would do would actually just sort of try and encourage conversations. We'd try and get John and Marilyn to talk to one another. And that's what gives it this lovely kind of conversational and, and almost lyrical kind of tone. We were particularly intrigued by this kind of idea of a sort of joint act of remembrance of the, of, of the two of them sort of reflecting on events from kind of a distance of 30 years. And, and, uh, and that's something we kind of actively encouraged and, and, then, and then interwove all of these materials uh, together, um, which was, yeah, an interesting process of kind of excavating this material. And... Um, I was saying to you upstairs, by the, time we actually, uh, by the time we actually came to shoot a single frame of the film, um, we actually had a kind of an audio edit of it, uh, of it running at 90 minutes. So we had a kind of a screenplay that our cast and, and collaborators could read and an, and an audio soundtrack that they could listen to at the same time. So it was an unusual way of, uh, of making a, a film, yeah. I thought that might be a good way for any filmmaker to get financing, you know, as, an, as another way. Um, was it a hard film to finance? And the two short films that you mentioned, the really short one that was shown here in Sydney and also the longer one, which you can actually see on the New York Times OpDoc site, were you thinking at that time this is all sort of proof of concept material with which we can get the film up? Um, I think there was... So, so when we first came across the material, we, we did recognize very quickly that it had the potential for a long-form project. And we're always along the, the, the kind of the way of making those short films. James and I were always developing our kind of our screenplay. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was in part kind of proof of concept, but then we, also, we also very much saw them as, as um, kind of standalone short films that we hoped would, would kind of work in, in their own right. Um, and, and they were kind of instrumental in enabling us to develop our kind of our style and approach um, and our aesthetic. And 
mostly in terms of our relationship with, with our, our, our collaborators, our other heads of department, um, Jerry Floyd, our cinematographer, as I say, also our production designer, um, a guy called Damien Craig, and our, um, and our sound designer, Joachim Sundstrom, as well. So it was, um, it was, a, it was a, yeah, a bit of both, really. It was us sort of teasing out our, our, our approach to, to this material and how we could interpret it. Um, as well as, yeah, as you mentioned, kind of a crucial tool in helping us demonstrate to, to funders and supporters exactly how we'd, how we'd go about um, making it into a longer form piece. How difficult was it to finance? And I guess I'm pressing this point because, you know, there's no sort of strong driving narrative, is there? And in a way, the film's got some aspects that are like rules about, you mustn't make a film like this, like voiceover and... Yeah. How difficult was it? Um, yeah, I mean, it was. Looking looking back, it, it was it was it wasn't easy. But I, I don't know. Are there any other filmmakers here who um, who've tried to get feature projects off the ground? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's 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 always making any film or getting any film financed is is incredibly difficult to do. Um, I mean, we were in many ways we were quite fortunate insofar as. Um, there was, you know, there was recognised IP. You know, the, the, the John's book in, its, in itself had, had received such, uh, such, a, such wonderful reviews that people recognised that, that John was an important voice, and you know, that in a sense, that that gave it a certain kind of validity that made it a lot easier to pitch. Um, and by the time we made our short film, I guess our approach to it was pretty out there. So. Getting the funding together for that, we actually got some funding from smaller arts grants, which are no longer available in the UK, sadly. But there was a fantastic organisation, particularly uh, one called Ideas Tap, which was just amazing and gave grants out to um, emerging and new, new filmmakers and artists. And, and they were very supportive in the early days. So once we got that together and once we made that first short film, it did feel like there was a certain kind of momentum that was building, and although it was quite incremental, it was also quite organic. And and we, yeah, I mean, it doesn't sound like it was too strategic, but you know, there's obviously a clear lineage. We were always stepping up from the three minutes to the twelve minutes to the to the feature film, um, and all our funders were incredibly receptive, and um, a lot of them were actually kind of tracking the projects, which is which is one thing that. Uh, funders will, will say to you in the early days is that like, yeah, we'll, we'll keep an eye on this, keep in touch, check back in with us in six months' time. So, so we had a lot of them uh, interested, I suppose, from quite early on. And it wasn't until, well, there was a kind of a tipping point in 2014 where everybody sort of came on board. But, um, but yeah, it was, you know, it was, we didn't have a, any reputation, actually, James and myself. It's our first feature film. Um, so inevitably, there's a high degree of risk for, for people to invest that kind of money. And um, a lot of these public funders, of course, only have a, a, a finite amount of resources. So they need to be convinced and they need to be sure that you're the project that they, they should be backing. But, um, but yeah, it was, you know, it wasn't easy, but it was, um, it was, you know, it was okay. Yeah. So you've said that you would regularly go and visit John and Marilyn and get them to talk to each other. Um, but were they involved or how involved were they in actually what was going to appear on screen in the film? And did they influence that? Were you, yeah, talk, could you talk about that? Yeah. Certainly. So they, they didn't really have any input into the, the sort of the, the script development process. Um, or, or any of the uh, kind of aesthetic choices or so forth. But they were, we do very much consider them kind of collaborators in the project because, um, because it's such a personal archive. And in, in, in effect, John has been telling this story for, for three decades. You know, it is his story to, to tell. Um, he's been refining it, and the way that he would tell it is, uh, um, is something that he's been kind of uh, boiling down and distilling over the decades. So we can never stray too far away from, from his story anyway, in that sense. Um, but in terms of our kind of our visual approach, I suppose, a lot of the kind of the key imagery in the film, mostly, you know, water and particles and, and elements and so forth, is all contained within the original diaries. Um, and, and there was this incredibly rich kind of source of, of, of material for us to be able to draw on. Um, really, 
James and I always say that actually whenever we hit a kind of a, a stumbling block or came up against a wall in the, in the development process, we'd just return to, to the diary material. Even stuff where we thought we were taking some kind of creative liberty over, we'd often discover a few months later when we're <laughs> looking for something else that actually it's very much contained in this original material and uh, subliminally it sort of sunk in somewhere. Um, it is such a vast and, and a vast trove of, of material that, 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 yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a real pleasure and a real kind of um, really, a really um, yeah, wonderful creative pursuit and uh, privilege to have been involved in. When I was walking here from the state, I just noticed sound so much more, and I wonder if you do. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, some of the, um, some of the, uh, when John's book was initially published, a lot of the, a lot of the sort of uh, praise for it was actually not so much that it was a, it was a, it was a, an account of blindness, but it actually teaches us something about the role of the visual. Um, in, in, in our lives and how and, and in human experience and and obviously um, it's kind of John's uh, sensory awakening through sound and through touch is a big part of that um, and it's something we were very very interested in 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 kind of uh, yeah ensuring that that, that that we gave gave the attention to in the, in the development of the production I think we spent we have spent longer in, in the post-production of the sound than we did in the, in the uh, post-production on the picture. Um, we're going to be releasing the film with three separate soundtracks for blind and partially sighted audiences. We've done a, a Dolby Atmos mix, which is kind of, rather than having your kind of conventional 5.1 uh, cinema setup, it has sort of 64 channels, including kind of speakers in the roof. Uh, only plays in a couple of cinemas. It's not really widely available. Um, and, and of course, uh, we've also got a, a virtual reality experience, which is, is playing in the final days today um, at, at, over at the Festival Hub. Um, and that is really, really very much inspired by John's perceptive environment, and particularly sound, and particularly his development of his senses, um, uh, and this discovery of kind of an acoustic world. Um, he talks very... Um, yeah, very articulately about, about the, uh, this process of kind of mapping acoustic space, about how sound can sort of bring, um, bring objects and, and people in and out of existence. Um, the rain, you mentioned how rain creates depth and detail and contour to the world around him, or, or how weather, um, uh, for, for thunder puts a roof over his head, or um, the, the wind in the trees can, can bring the sound of in, environment to life and volumize space. It's yeah, really fascinating. And um, yeah, if you have a chance to check out the virtual reality, because that uses binaural audio as well, which is kind of... Um, yeah, uh, sort of mimics hum uh, human perception and movement. So the sound is tethered to your head, head movements and so forth. So, yeah, sound was uh, integral. Such a great scene, that indoor raining scene, wasn't it? Um, it's not unusual for two people to direct a film, but it's also not common. So you two must be about as close as husband and wife now. Um, but how did, how did that work in the context of this film for you two? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, developing a film, we've been working on this for over five years. It's quite a long process. And, um, you know, there's a certain companionship in, in directing together. And, and, and I think we would have probably... In, there were times where collectively we lost our minds. So, to, so, so heaven knows what would have happened if it had just been one of us. It was, um, you know, it wasn't always, as I say, it wasn't always an easy film to pitch. It was a, a film, um, a film about blindness in a medium that's, you know, pr pr predominantly defined by the visual, and it's based on a sound archive. You know, it's about it's about a, an academic who. He lost his sight in the 1980s. It's not, you know, it's not the, it's not electric. It's not necessarily electric in terms of pitching. Um, so, so it wasn't always, it wasn't always easy in that sense. And therefore, to have have someone else to sort of go through it, uh, go through the process with, was kind of in, 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 in instrumental for us, really. Um, and yeah, the development process was was incredibly collaborative, um, not only between James and myself, but also, as I say, with, with a lot of our other heads of department and with John and Marilyn. 
And um, that's, you know, film is inherently a collaborative kind of medium, and it requires you know um, people with expertise in all these different departments to sort of come together for the greater good. And I think that's uh, yeah, I think we are seeing increasingly um, that directing pairs and duos are, are becoming more commonplace. So um, I can I can I totally uh, yeah totally. I uh, recommend it if anyone's thinking of uh, <laughs> But did you take the lead more in one area of the process? Um, so on the whole, it was, uh, we try and make a lot of our decisions before. I mean, so, so in, the, in the development process, then it's, you know, it's no one notices. Essentially, you've got, you've just got two people to do the work of, of, of one person. So, um, But in, when it comes to being on set, and of course, the way that we filmed this was much more, in effect, by the time we came to shoot the film, was, um, was much more aligned with uh, the production of a, of a narrative fiction film. You know, we had a crew of 20 to 30 people on set. We were in studios, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's vitally important that you're kind of singing from the same hymn sheet and um, I guess James and I would always try and um, try and make sure that all of those decisions were taken away from sets. So when we when we had to present them, that we knew what um, you know. We were all, we were both saying the same thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess we kind of like we always had this thing where if uh, generally if, if one of us was uncomfortable with an idea or a decision, then it invariably meant that it wasn't necessarily the right thing and required more thought. And and often by coming together, you'd find. Um, and, and by raising that, you'd find a new path um, on which to, yeah, on which to, to tread. Um. I want to know where the Victorian material was shot. Um, I'm not sure I should give it away, but uh, <laughs> unfortunately, it was shot in Wales in the UK. I don't know. Did anyone? I, we've had some very funny comments about it over the. We were in Rotterdam and. A journalist who was interviewing us uh, asked... Actually, we had, we had kind of mixed reception uh, when we were in Rotterdam. We were, some people, some Australians who met there were, were, were really com were convinced. But one journalist was like, uh, said to us that um, it didn't really matter because it was clearly just an Australia of the imagination, um, which we quite liked as a get-out clause. But I don't know, what did, what did people think? Was it convincing? Well, I mean, we, did, we did model it very closely on... Um, which, there's a place that, that, that John was talking about called the Lockhart Gorge, which I'm sure uh, some of you know in, in, in uh, Victoria. And uh, we tried to find a location that would match there for the cliffs, but I don't know. James and I have never been to Australia before, so we were winging it slightly. <laughs> Um, I don't even know if I can answer this question in a way, ask this question in a way that's intelligible, but I kept thinking about the choices that you had about the visuals once your, um, is that right? Once your script was in place. And I kept thinking about the way reality TV decides, oh, we're going to paint that character to be you know, the biggest bitch and we're going to paint that character to be the nice one or we're going to... I mean, could, could you have made lots of films from those tapes? Like, how many, how, much audio, how many hours of audio did you have in the end, counting all those sources? And, yeah, what, what, what is your answer to that, quest, that strange question? Yeah, I th well, I, I think that's often the case with, with a documentary, isn't it? I think, so, so James and I are, uh, in, we are, we very much do believe that, that actually the, the process, and particularly the initial kind of development process, very much anchors the film in, in, in documentary, this kind of sifting through and distilling um, these different audio sources into a kind of coherent story. Um, and so the number of hours we were working with, I, th I mean, it must have been over 50, I suppose. And as with any document, I mean, that's not actually a particularly high number for a lot of documentaries, particularly observational documentaries, which hundreds of hours sometimes. Um, and so I think, I think that's the case with any, with any documentary film, actually, is that if you give that material to, to one filmmaker, they'd make an altogether different film to another. So um, not wanting to avoid the question, but... But you have. <laughs> but I have, yeah. <laughs> and the other thing which I touched on when we talked earlier today, just about how the actress 
and the way she was presented in the 12 minute short is quite different to the actress that you eventually chose for this feature. To me, um, the actress in the feature rooted the film much more in a period setting. But, you know, can you talk about why you chose those two actresses? This is uh, a hard question, sorry, because you haven't seen the short film, but yeah, there is, she looks um, quite yeah, different. There, so there's, there's, there's different um, actors and actresses in, in the short film to the feature film. Um, and Celia and Rafe, who played Marilyn and John in the short film, were fantastic, and, and, and we, we, we owe so much to them, and they've been wonderfully uh, supportive to the project over the years. Um, but when we came to cast for the feature film, there's, there's one quite significant um, difference in, 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 in the approach, and this is the, the lip syncing, um, which is a particularly kind of peculiar um, sort of skill for for, for actor to, to, to kind of um, to master. Um, and we were we 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 sort of auditioned extensively, and actually there's a there's a film that was was kind of very very uh, important to us in terms of in terms of influencing the style. It was a, a, a documentary called The Arbor, which was um, I'm not sure if it was released over here, but it's a, it was about the playwright Andrea Dunbar, um, British playwright, and and that, that uses these kind of lip syncing techniques. It kind of restages interviews with actors playing her family who are lip-syncing to the original audio, documentary audio. And um, we were particularly taken by this technique and thought this could be a way of kind of uh, enabling us to preserve something of that kind of immediacy um, that I was, I was speaking to and, and retain the authenticity of the, the diaries. Um, now, it's, it's a peculiar skill. And... Um, and there's a certain kind of musicality to the lip syncing. In fact, sorry, I mentioned the Arbor because we then sought out their casting director um, who had cast that film, uh, someone called Amy Hubbard. And, and she was the person who found uh, Dan Skinner and Simone Kirby, who played John and Mara in the feature. And yeah, as I say, there's a certain kind of musicality to, 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 to mastering the, the lip syncing. We, we, we give Dan and Simone the, the, the material in advance. So rather than doing rehearsals, We'd effectively just send them audio files, and they'd learn the rhythm and cadence of the of the, of, of, of the words. And then on set, we'd have um, instead of recording sound, we didn't record any live sound at all. We'd have a um, we'd have a, someone we called a sort of playback engineer who would essentially kind of just uh, tee up each line, and put pips in beforehand, and count them down. It's yeah, peculiar, but um, but yeah, that was that was that was behind the casting choice. Really, it's um, it's, it's not an easy thing to to master. Because John has a very distinctive way of talking, doesn't he? Do you think that was always the case or did that come about because of his blindness? Maybe we can ask his sister yeah, this. I think it might be the best <laughs> thing to do. So Jan, as you say, is in the audience. He was very close to John. Um, and this is... Uh, do you want to answer that question? So this is John's sister, Jan. Hi, everybody. Um, I think John always did have that kind of distinctive voice. Uh, but I think it probably uh, did increase uh, in, in, in the thoughtful way that he spoke. He, he, as you could hear on the film, he was, he was very thoughtful about everything he said. Um, so I think that being blind perhaps emphasised that. While you've got the microphone, <laughs> could you tell us what the reaction of your family was? I mean, I guess the first thing was the book, wasn't it? But to then hear that a film was going to be made and then to see the film and a likeness of him in the film, that's a very big question to expect you to answer, but yes. Well, the book was published... The first book, Touching the Rock, was published in 1990. Uh, and it was... He made those original tapes partly because he didn't want the uh, family to experience the grief that he was going through. He wanted to record it to deal with himself and, you know, not to upset the family too much. So reading the book was upsetting because really, uh, for me, uh, although I was very close and I lived for some years in England and visited regularly, I didn't uh, understand everything that he'd gone through. Um, the second question uh, of the film, 
we absolutely love the film. The, the whole family, uh, I'm the only Australian member that has seen the film, but Marilyn and the children and I absolutely love it. We think that the filmmakers have made a wonderful tribute to John uh, and that every character in that film is instantly recognisable as our family. I feel when I'm looking at the film, I'm looking at John because, of course, I'm hearing him. And, and Marilyn's voices, and my mother's voice, uh, which is uncanny because she died in, in 1987. So when I first walked onto the film script, uh, the film set uh, in London, the first voice I heard was my mother's. So it, it was quite difficult. So the film is painful to look at, but uh, we, we love it. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, the other thing I was curious about was because he was a lecturer in theology, whether it was a big decision about how much about God would be in the film. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, Sir so, so John was a, a theologian, a very, very well regarded, internationally regarded theologian. Um, and and had a very deep and profound um, and intellectual faith, um, and it's uh, it's it's something that's that's um, it was very very important to him during this time, and indeed has been um, throughout uh, throughout his entire life. Um, and I think to uh, blindness for him, he did describe blindness as a, as a bit of a crisis of faith. Not not insofar as the kind of the why me question. He didn't believe in an in, you know, interventionist uh, uh, God or what have you. But he did he did um, he did he, he described it as uh, as not sort of feeling the kind of the calm acquiescence that that is supposed to be the um, the, uh, the 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 kind of the the, the feeling of, of those who who live a life of faith, and and that was profoundly troubling for him. And it was only when he began to sort of reconceptualize it and, 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 and think more deeply about the relationship between blindness and religion. And he's written several books on it since, um, on the relationship between uh, disability and blindness and, and, and faith, um, that he came to this notion of, of, of blindness as a sort of a, as, as a gift and that it gave him a, a kind of understanding, I suppose, or a sort of... Um, uh, a sort of uh, a certain a certain level of empathy with with those who are marginalised or suffering, and and that that really did sort of propel and inform his kind of um, uh, yeah his his kind of his worldview his outlook for the for the remaining three decades of of his life. So um, it was it was something that we were very sensitive to in developing the film, and um, and we we hope that uh, we've got got that balance right and we've represented it um, ac accurately but it, but yeah it's it's a he's such an it's such an intelligent guy that it's such a complicated and nuanced relationship with god that it was a very difficult sort of path to 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 try and untangle i don't know jan have you got anything more to to say other than than that maybe you're better to speak about it no <laughs> <laughs> Jan just said but, she's got nothing to say because she's an atheist. But likewise, yeah. I'm going to ask two more questions and then open it up to you guys. There's a couple of roving mics and it's very important that you ask your question on mic because this um, is being videoed and is going up online. Um, earlier, uh, Peter told me that they only had three weeks to edit the film because Sundance offered them a spot. And I think probably when Sundance offers you a spot and you've just finished shooting, you go anything. But when you look at the film now and in retrospect, do you think the fact that you had such a short amount of time was a good or a bad thing? And well, there's no way of answering that question, really. I don't think. But, but so just to just to sort of expand on that slightly, yeah, we, you're absolutely right. We had three weeks to get a uh, get a, a cut in, which is is, is a crazily short time. <laughs> um, although there is a slight kind of caveat to that, insofar as because we because we did by the time we came to shoot, as I say, we did have this kind of audio edit of the film. Um, 
effectively our, our editor, a wonderful um, editor called, called Jules Quantrill, was, was, was assembling scenes as we were going along and was kind of dropping them into the timeline. So really, by the time we, we'd set foot in the edit suite on that, the, the morning after we'd finished shooting, um, we had an, a, a very messy assembly of the entire film. So, so yeah. But some uh, films are made in the edit. You have to admit. Oh, absolutely, and it, it did change quite wildly. Now, now there were there were quite significant implications of that deadline. Um, there is there is a whole kind of fifteen minute, twenty minute um, sort of act almost, which just we couldn't make work. Uh, we knew that we wouldn't be able to make it work within three weeks, and so it got cut straight away, and we never revisited the, all of that material. And I think that's, for better or for worse, yeah, one of the big Im impacts. Like the, w as soon as you kind of work towards getting a cut that you're prepared to share with people, I suppose, certain big decisions get made that, that, that preclude other, other things. And, and, and so, it, yeah, it, ha it has changed a bit since that first three-week cut, but not wildly. So undoubtedly, it did have a quite a big uh, quite a big impact i think so pleased or sorry about having three weeks well, if we didn't have you know you do need deadlines to <laughs> to finish stuff um yeah i don't know i don't know it's been, a, it's been quite a long process uh, it's you know uh it, it's it's we've had such a fantastic reception to the film and not just here in sydney but wherever it's played and and so it's it's difficult for me to sit up here and complain, really. Um, it's, been, it's been a wonderful experience, really. So, um, so our cinemas, certainly mainstream cinemas, are full of superheroes rather than gentle heroes or films with a gentle power like this one. What are your expectations? Re I mean, it's obviously uh, much sought after by festivals, but I wonder what your expectations are in terms of getting out, getting it out in a commercial sense, and can you tell us um, where it's at on that front? Yeah, absolutely. So we've had a wonderful um, reception to the film in the UK, uh, and it's been picked up by a, a, one of the UK's leading independent distributors, Curzon Artificial Eye, who are rolling it out in, in cinemas from the 1st of July there alongside which we're kind of we're sort of doing this uh, a, a sort of a tour which begins on the 24th of, of June which previews the film and the VR project in cinemas together which I think is kind of the first thing that's ever really been done first time that's ever been done um, but it's yeah it's getting it's getting a great response back home and it should have for certainly for a documentary a pretty pretty great release um, and, and then in the US, um, it will be coming out in November, October, and Oscilloscope, another really great independent um, distributor, are putting it out there. Still to be teased out exactly how and, um, how, and how far. But, but yeah, it seems to be, people seem to be recognizing that, that um, it's a film that is, is perhaps best uh, experienced in a cinema. Um, as for Australia, we're, we're not entirely sure. We don't have an Australian distributor as yet. So um, I know certain conversations have been going on, but um, I don't think there's anything in the pipeline yet. But um, obviously, we'd, we'd love to uh, put it out in cinemas here. Who's got a question? OK. Hi, yeah. Um, you said that you've done a soundtrack for people who are blind or vision impaired. Um, when you were editing the film, were you consciously making room for the audio description, or was it was that a factor when you were actually making the film? Great question. Uh, so, I mean, throughout the development of the of the project and the short films, we were always sort of consciously um, uh, trying to trying to ensure that the accessibility was built built into it, and and we were working with. Um, with some really fantastic people in the UK, some researchers at the University of Roehampton, namely who are kind of some of the world leaders in audiovisual translation, and they um, and they've got some very interesting ideas about how to sort of build in this kind of integrated approach, and and in effect by 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 getting considering accessibility from early on in the production process rather than just sort of stapling it on at the end, it can benefit everyone. Um, it's the the audio description and the spacing for it is complicated because it's it's driven so much by narration, um, so therefore it doesn't leave an awful lot of space there. Um, but equally, because it is so narrationally heavy, then um, I mean, it, it in effect, like what's happening up on the screen 
and the picture is often at times um, sort of subservient to the narration itself. So, so, the, so what's being said is far more important than, than what's being seen. And so there's a delicate balance always to navigate there. Um, but one of the things that we are doing, as well as doing a kind of conventional audio description track, um, is, is this, uh, an idea of an enhanced sound design. So we've done, um, we've done a, a, a whole new soundtrack for the film, which has, um, has more narration in from John and Marilyn, rather than having an external kind of uh, narrator um, that you would have an audio description. The, uh, the two of them sort of narrate what's going on in screen for more. Not always literally, but it kind of tonally coheres with what's happening. And um, this is something we're really excited about. We, we premiered it at Sheffield Documentary Festival on Tuesday, just on Tuesday, and had a very good reception. And in effect, people were coming up to us and saying, so what's the difference between this and the, and the actual one? And, and surely this is, 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 sh is the one that you should be screening. And we're totally hoping that it's going to be foregrounded there. Um, and, and so that will be available as well. We're releasing a kind of an app which will allow audiences to select which soundtrack they can listen to. And so they can share in the experience. And, and you could have, you, know, you could in theory have a scenario where you've got several people watching the same picture but listening to different soundtracks at the same time. Um, and of course, all of these different approaches to accessibility will be available on all platforms in cinemas, in, um, on video on demand, and, and broadcast hopefully through. Uh, we call it red button services in the UK, but you know the, um, and yeah, so so lots lots of really exciting stuff going on, and and we it is it is quite experimental, and we very much value um, value people's feedback and responses to it. It's uh, the enhanced one is is not trying to be audio description; it's trying to be something a bit different, um, and uh, we hope that it, it goes down <laughs> well. But uh, in fact, it's about choice as much as anything. Um, not all blind, partially sighted people are that into audio description. John himself never listened to watch films with audio description. So um, it's about trying to find new ways of bringing in audiences who are currently kind of excluded from cinema. So. Hi, um, congratulations. It's a really fantastic work. I've been, I watched the short as well. I'm a, a fan. Thank um, you. I just wanted to, to know at which point in the process you started developing the VR project and in which way that kind of opened up and a new dimension to work with the material, and, and what is that? Oh, thank you so much for the question. Yeah, um, so quite early on in the process, James and myself were, were, were aware that actually, for much of John's material, we've, we were conscious that cinema wasn't necessarily the best kind of creative expression for it, really. Um, and particularly, as I, as I mentioned earlier, that. Uh, the passages in John's diaries that explored some of his kind of um, sensory or perceptive experiences. Um, and we were, we were always aware that we, yeah, we were kind of sitting on this uh, like sort of gold mine of, of, of archive. And, um, and in about 2012, 2013, we began kind of pitching various kind of uh, iterations of, of um, interactive projects. This is before VR was really on the scene, of course. Um, and they were quite different, actually, to how it's turned out. But, but the, the crucial factor, the crucial kind of turning point was working with our, our French co-producers. So Arte France, a, a big, big um, uh, public broadcaster in, 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 in France, came on board in 20, uh, early 2014. Conversations were going on before then. And, and, and they were particularly looking for projects which had this kind of dual... Um, dual component, so the film alongside some kind of interactive project. And they linked us up with some fantastically talented uh, people at uh, a production company called Agat, uh, Ex Nilio, which, in, in, in particular, a guy called Arno Colinar, who is, um, he was, yeah, uh, very, it's very well regarded in kind of interactive um, uh, documentaries and projects. And indeed, uh, one of the other key developers uh, who worked, um, worked with Arno is, is, is here, Landia. Um, and so 
they began exploring uh, different approaches. And actually, what they initially came up with wasn't, um, wasn't VR at all, because, as I say, VR was still quite nascent and, and, and developed then, but was, was the kind of uh, 360 web-based experience where, in effect, you could kind of uh, hold your tablet up and, and move it around, and then the, uh, with binaural audio, um, the, the picture would kind of respond to, to, to the sound. Um, and then VR came onto the scene, and I think quite quickly, I, I don't know, is it, it was like in 2015 that it was, 24, yeah. The, yeah, okay. So, and then, and then it got sort of re-engineered for that effectively. Um, but they've been, it's been such a wonderful experience, and we very much see them as kind of complementary experiences, the film and the VR, and, and we do try and encourage people to, to try and experience both. They're very different, and we see them as kind of different entry points to John's experience of blindness. And um, yeah, if you, if you do have the opportunity, do check it out. Thank you, that was really wonderful. Um, I just I had a couple of questions. One was, when would Australians be able to access the more accessible formats that are being developed on the film? Yeah, sure. Well, we're hoping, so as I say, we don't have a distributor, so we don't know when that release date would be, but um, the idea is that whenever, um, that these materials are, will, will be available when the film is released in whatever territory. So when that date is, is announced, if that date's announced then. And so when that's announced, the more accessible formats with the Absolutely, audience. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And the second question was, obviously, John, that when the film, well, when you, the main part of the film ends at a particular point, and then we see him in older age at the end, obviously his story develops between those periods. Um, did you think at all of you know, incorporating his whole life into the film or just finishing with the period of the tapes? Yeah, good question. So, I mean, so, so I mean, the important determining factor was John stopped recording the tapes. Yes. Um, he felt like, uh, as, as Jan spoke to, what had initially become, uh, begun as a sort of catharsis, really, this very private act of recording his, his, uh, his feelings, not wanting to burden the family with, with his sort of sense of, of loss, really. Um, he, there was a, a time, and that's obviously shown in the film, where the necessity of that just sort of diminished and the, the, the recording of the tapes became in, more and more infrequent and then eventually stopped altogether. Um, and so it was, never really, it was never really on the cards, no. We were, we were focused on, 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 on that period of time. And, um, uh, but, but as you say, actually... And this is something that, that we often talk about with, with Marilyn, with John's wife, in, in Q&As, that, 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 that the, 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 the film focuses on a particular period, but that actually wasn't, <laughs> wasn't really the, the John that she knew, of course. 30 years of, uh, on from that, John grew into, uh, into an incredible personality. And he'd often describe blindness just as a, as a, as a hobby. He didn't want to be defined by, by his blindness. He was incredibly engaged in... in um, in many other kind of uh, interests and aspects of, of life, not just in, th in, in theology, but also uh, campaigning for social justice. Um, uh, a lot of the kind of uh, and, um, nuclear disarmament movement in the UK, he was heavily involved in. Jan was saying just yesterday that he even spent a couple of nights in prison for, for protesting. So, so he, was, he had this incredible range of interests and was an incredible character and um, uh, a really, yeah, really vibrant personality. Um, and in effect, our film yeah, focuses on, on, on this key transitional period, but uh, that it would lead to sort of a, a blooming of that character and personality. Thank you. Jan wants to say something to that, I think. Yeah, that was the most difficult part of his uh, blindness, you know, the, the years of the film that you... Uh, concentrated on and as he grew more and more into deep what he called deep blindness and began to accept it um, well he changed quite dramatically I suppose as you did did say but what was not you weren't able to bring out in the film because it's a serious film is he had an enormous sense of humor he was a really really funny person and he uh, was able um, as he grew more into blindness to be able to enjoy 
uh, a lot of family holidays, which at first he found just painful and difficult. Uh, and we even got him into the sea once, which was quite hard for a blind person to go swimming. And also, uh, I got him... Uh, you mentioned that he never did watch films. Um, uh, well, we did get him into watching uh, some, some funny films that, that did have dialogue with me doing the descriptions. Uh, the Marx Brothers. And he, <laughs> and he absolutely loved it. So every year he was, you know, more and more accepting and, and more and more adjusting and right up until the time he died, which was sadly just before the film was completed. We've only got about three or four minutes left, so ask away if you have a question or you'll lose your chance. A microphone, just, ah. Um, um, so most of the people's eyes aren't shown in um, the feature film, except for John's and Marilyn's, so you can't really see their facial expressions. And so was this compositional decision made to, like, what, why was this decision? Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you for the question. Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, so much of uh, so much of cinema is really defined by 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 the visual um, and the grammar of cinema. So things like eye lines, um, spatial kind of geography, and so forth. And and we, uh, along with our cinematographer, tried to develop an aesthetic, a sort of a style that would kind of work against that. I think. Um, and part of that was was in in framing and 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 considered use of framing of supporting characters, and it, in particular, um, it, so so yeah, either framing or shooting them in silhouette or in shadow or um, through translucent surface, semi-translucent surfaces, um, and that particularly applied to the family. Um, there's that there's a, a passage where John talks about the recession of visual memory, how. The image of his uh, of his children, uh, sort of, in, in, which initially was kind of fossilized after losing sight, grew faint and then kind of faded altogether. Um, and so, yeah, that very much informed our kind of our, the way that we the way that we shot um, supporting um, our supporting cast. And uh, so, yeah, it was a very conscious choice, and one that we kind of partic uh, working over the course of the film. It, it, it kind of became ingrained in the way that we'd, we'd approach it and the way that we'd set up shots. We wouldn't, we wouldn't shoot the reverse angle of, of supporting characters and our crew soon quickly found the, the, the kind of the, the, into that rhythm, um, which obviously restricted us in the, in the edit, but it was something we stuck to and um, I think we're, we're, yeah, we're pleased with the kind of effect of it. Um, but yeah, the idea was really just to try and close down the space and, and suggest something of of John's kind of reduced world, as he described it. Um, um, yeah. Um, is this what is this? It? Yeah. Um, congratulations on your lovely film. Um, I'm very interested. I'd like to ask more questions about the photography, which I thought was beautifully evocative. And you mentioned at the beginning that um, your um, cinematographer tried out various possibilities. And I just wondered if you could elaborate a little more on, on the lighting choices you eventually um, made and how you came to make them, because it, do, it does add so much to the film, the way it's, uh, the, the atmosphere, I guess, is, is developed. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So, yeah, we, we worked um, very closely with Jerry, as I said, um, to try and define, to try and kind of identify some of these sort of stylistic principles. Um, a big one was the one I was just speaking to about the way that we'd frame uh, supporting characters, really. Um, and so everybody apart from John and Marilyn, who, of course, we felt slightly, could fall slightly outside of this rule because they're both the narrators of the film. So... So that gives us a little bit more, um, a little bit more flexibility with showing them their faces, and that was that was a, that was a really big one. Um, as much though was was uh, around uh, around wide shots. We never there aren't any kind of clean wide shots in the film. Um, we never really wanted the audience to have a kind of a privileged perspective of the, of, um, of of the scene. Um, and then, of course, considered use of, of light and shadow, trying to denote kind of um, territory, really, or shades of, of John's awareness. 
Um, framing, framing, as I say, of, of characters, framing of, uh, of, of John himself, um, trying to always, always uh, trying to st start a lot of scenes on, uh, on John's hands was another one, um, to sort of foreground the, the prevalence of, 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 of tactile, tactile senses. Um, so yeah, all these little kind of uh, stylistic, um, yeah, decisions really. But um, it was, yeah, it was as soon as we sort of, yeah, as soon as it began, it, it grew quite organically in the development process. We 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 sort of thrashed them out with with Jerry, our cinematographer, and um, and then yeah, it's sort of uh, yeah, just kind of stuck to them. But is there a lucky last question, Jan? It's, it's not a question, I'm sorry, but it's just another comment about John. Uh, in the film, he said how horrible it was to discover uh, that he was a useless father. But in fact, he wasn't. He was an absolutely wonderful father. His children adored him. He really learned how to... Uh, to play with them. Uh, when they were kids, he had books brailed so he could read to them. Uh, and uh, he was a very, lo very loving person. And I think um, a very compassionate and, and a wonderful brother. He, he just was gorgeous. It's been lovely having you here, Jan, hearing these family comments. I love it when he says, I've, I'd never been so happy to do the dishes or whatever that line exactly was. Um, I'll ask the last question. I think that's my favourite line in the film, but what is yours? Favourite line? I mean, so I don't know about favourite line, but I mean, one of the things that were particularly curious to the material was John's dreaming life, actually. Um, and it's a big part of the, of the book. Uh, John still dreamt kind of visually for years after losing his sight. Um, and we found this in incredibly, yeah, incredibly kind of engaging. A lot of these kind of big operatic, uh, cinematic almost dreams. So, so the flooding supermarket, um, the dreams of being kind of dragged down to the depths of the, the ocean. These were, these really characterized his early years of sight loss um, and were very vivid and, and, and very arresting. And I think, um, yeah, it was particularly when we came to sort of thinking about how to interpret this material, we knew that this, his dreaming life would be, would be an important part of, of, of the film. And so there's that, there's that one line um, where he says, every, every time I wake up, I lose my sight. Um, that I think probably sticks with me. Um, and of course, yeah, the, the dream of his daughter, Lizzie, um, as well, seeing her face for the first time. You know, it's, it's, there's, we found that very powerful. Yeah. It is a wonderful, wonderful film. Thanks for making it. Please give Peter a big round of applause. <laughs> <laughs>